In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. As some of you may know, I was raised on a farm in northern Wisconsin. And as it goes with any farm kid, we sometimes get tired of what people think rural life is really like. Contrary to popular imagination, farms in Wisconsin are not always picturesque with black and white cows and white and red barns. Though I suppose I have to confess that I did grow up on such a Wisconsin farm. Farm life, though, isn't really all that idyllic most days. And farm animals are not always clean, cute, and charming. In more ways than one, they can be awful stinkers. They have minds of their own. They are typically stubborn and impossible. My family did not raise sheep, but I did grow up around cattle, horses, and one goat. And they all managed to be just as trying as sheep so often are. More often than not, they were clever enough to get themselves into serious trouble. But once they were in the thick of a crisis, they'd suddenly become helpless and incapable of figuring out how to get out of the mess they so thoughtfully got themselves into. Most trying, though, is when these animals would actively disobey your commands and your voice. For as you might expect, these animals became accustomed to my voice and my family members' voices. And so once they figured out that you were coming to get them from the pasture for, say, a visit from the vet, or to exercise them, or to give them a cleaning, they'd run the other way. They heard you coming, they ignored your calls for them, and thought they could outsmart and escape you. Needless to say, they were no longer so cute and charming. I tell you all of this because it's not uncommon for Christians to have the wrong idea about what life in the church is really like. They hear the words of our Lord from the Gospel reading today, and then they develop a misguided picture of the church. They assume that this business of shepherds and sheep is an innocent one. But quite frankly, life in the church is not so. It isn't always idyllic and picturesque. We aren't always in green pastures, near serene pools of water, and skipping around without a care in the world. No, it says Jesus has it in today's Gospel reading. Life in the sheepfold is troublesome, and it's filled with a great many dangers. There are not only strangers, thieves, and robbers lurking outside the fence waiting to snatch you away from the shepherd, but there are also wicked and evil voices calling out to you. You, of course, already know this, though. You know that there is no shortage of voices in our world today all trying to shepherd you away from Christ. They are those smooth-talking deceivers who climb into the sheepfold. They are the false prophets, false teachers, false churches, false promises, and false thinking of the world, all inspired by Satan, and all desiring to lead us away from Christ. By hook or by crook, they will come and they will try to take us away from him, to have us become disappointed with Christ or disillusioned with his church, or to go after that proverbial greener pasture. And yes, they're not only outside the sheepfold, outside the church, they even climb up over the walls and into the pastures to cause a ruckus. They are the voices that clog our heads with temptations and suggestions. They are the voices that want us to see that life outside the church is perhaps more enjoyable. For they tempt you with the free time and fun activities you might have if you didn't have to devote yourself to the church. You'd have the weekends to yourself. Your school and work friends, your neighbors, your family members, well, they'd just like you a little bit more, perhaps, if you weren't in the church with all its uncomfortable and awkward teachings and demands. They are the voices that suggest if you just come out into the real world, you wouldn't have to put up with all those silly sheep in your church anymore. For aren't you tired of dealing with the foolishness, the irritations, and the frustrations of your fellow Christians, they suggest? For those people in the church, have they ever considered your ideas, plans, and thoughts? Have they ever considered you and what your specific needs are? Perhaps they aren't as concerned for you as they like to make out. But hey, all of us out here in the world, away from the sheep pen, we are concerned for you. We care for you. We really know what's up. And if those tempting voices don't get you, then there are the voices from time to time troubling us with darker thoughts. Doubts about whether all this Christianity is really true. Doubts about the church. For it can't possibly be what it makes out to be. Look at it. Listen to it, the talking heads in our schools, media, and universities shout. The voices of our friends and family say, The church is a mess. It's corrupt. Its time has passed. The golden age is gone. Its glory faded. So time to pack up. But before we go on, we do need to address these misconceptions and silence the voices. First, it must be said that life in the church, life in the sheep pen, is not always idyllic, picturesque, or golden. It never has been. God has never promised that it would be. Consider the readings for today, especially the famous 23rd Psalm. While we do not know exactly when King David penned Psalm 23, we do know that his life and reign as King of Israel was not all green pastures and silent waters. 
There was plenty of sin for the adultery and murder he himself committed. And then there was political intrigue, a mutiny by his very own son, and plenty of suffering and doubt to go around. And as far as the early church goes, the church that we heard about in our first reading for today, and the epistle reading, well, it was really more bloody than golden. Yes, God's favor was with them. Yes, miraculous things were happening. Yes, the church was growing. But in the midst of all of that, the apostles were arrested, flogged, and martyred. Saul, before he became Saint Paul, was in the business of rounding up all the Christians he could find and doing away with them. And then there were the internal disagreements, the fighting and problems from the churches in Jerusalem to the churches in Corinth. All of these early Christian flocks were typically in a real mess. They were ambushed from without and from within. Because if we're honest with ourselves, it's not just thieves and robbers and strange voices outside the flock that lead us into sin. We ourselves play the part of robbers, thieves, and liars. For look at the life of King David and St. Paul once again. They were God's chosen people, yet they committed awful deeds while being part of the flock of Israel. And so the question is put to us. How often are we the ones who lie and slander and gossip inside the church? How often do we mislead fellow brothers and sisters into our own sin? How often are we angry with God for our lot in life? How often do we actively disobey God's word and then attack others when they confront us for it? So yes, wherever the church has been, there Satan has been attacking her from outside the fence and inside the fence. Whether it was in the Garden of Eden, 1st century Jerusalem, 21st century America, or any time in between. Wherever the sheep of the great shepherd are, there Satan is trying to scatter them, frighten them, and lure them into sin and out of the fold. And one of Satan's favorite tools is getting us to doubt either our own faith, or God's lasting love for us, or his sure promises. Or even worse, to convince us that we aren't thieves, robbers, and liars. And so know that if you are suffering or doubting or have been caught disobeying your Lord, you are in the company of the church. This is what life in the church is like. This is life in the sheep pen. Because truth be told, the Christian life is simply not a life free from suffering and doubt. It's not a life free from temptation and sin. Not a life absent of problems and pain. It is rather as Jesus described it in the Gospel reading. It's the true life. Not an imaginary one. Not a made up one. But a real one. For in the Gospel lesson for today, we see that Jesus brings together problems and peace, confusion and certainty, suffering and serenity, sin and forgiveness, all together in one realistic, not picturesque, no one realistic image of what life in the sheepfold is really like. And because this is a true picture of the Church, we then can have a real hope, not some false and unattainable hope of reproducing a never-existent golden age in the Church, or of having a life free from problems and struggles, but instead a life of hope and joy in the midst of these things, even while perhaps suffering for them. It is a hope in a life given abundantly, and a peace that will surpass this world. For Jesus doesn't trick us with smooth words or lure us in to join him with some false promises and grand ideas of an imaginary and picturesque church life. No, it's quite the contrary. Christ puts us right down in the midst of this life and says, Here it is. This is your life. And the church is going to be like a life in a sheepfold. Sometimes it's crowdy and smelly. Sometimes we find sheep we really just don't like. Sometimes there are fights among the sheep. Sometimes we don't feel like being shepherded ourselves and would rather just go off on our own. But you know what Jesus says to all of that? It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what you think. You all are my sheep. I created you and I have redeemed you. I took your sins to my very body. I died that you might live. You are mine and I love you. I love you when you're good and I love you when you're not so good. Yes, I will discipline you when you need it, but I will bandage your wounds when you're hurt. And I will go after you when you wander off. I will protect you and I will give you all that you need for this life. I do not promise you peace, sheep paradise, your own pasture, your own stream of water without other sheep tramping in on it, or your own private luxurious sheepfold. No, I promise you myself that I will never leave you or forsake you. You are not only mine, I am yours. He promises all of this to us, even while he tells us about the strangers and the robbers and the thieves who will come after us. He even promises it to thieves and robbers and liars like ourselves. For Jesus doesn't lie, he gives the truth. He says that these trials and temptations and evils will come our way, but he will not leave us because we are his. Yet that truth can really be overwhelming at times. 
And so perhaps the first thing we think of when these assaults on the faith come our way is, why? Why doesn't Jesus just build bigger walls around the sheepfold? Higher and stronger, better and surer defenses are what we need to keep these robbers, strangers, and thieves out. And wait a second, why? Why does Jesus let them in? Why doesn't our good shepherd just keep them out? Or maybe your trouble is that you aren't for having bigger walls and sure defenses from the assaults on your, on your faith. Perhaps you just want to escape it all some days. That although you want a spiritual life, it just seems like this is altogether too much in this life of ours. That your everyday life is too difficult. That the people and friends and family around you are far too exhausting. That you are too confused, too hurt, or too broken, perhaps. Too exhausted to keep putting up the good fight. That like a wounded animal, it would be better to just go off and suffer alone quietly. But that is not going to work for the great shepherd of our souls. He comes after us whether we like it or not, for he laid down his life for us. We are his and we need something more than ourselves. We need something greater than external walls to protect the sheepfold. We need something stronger than internal walls and layers we put up when we go off to suffer quietly and alone. What we need, quite simply, is the voice of our shepherd calling us away from these thoughts and doubts we entertain. For although such walls may seem better in the moment and may seem stronger, in reality they cannot give us what we need. They cannot protect us eternally. Only the voice of our shepherd can. For his is the only voice that grants forgiveness and life. And with that external divine voice forgiving our sins and healing our hearts, the peace that comes from that forgiveness... Then the healing begins from the inside out. For slow, for the voice of Jesus is which, what leads us through the troubles of this life, so that we would not follow the strange voices of thieves and robbers to our ruin. For his voice warns us that those strange voices will only hurt us and that we must flee from them. It is his voice that comes to us and calls out to us when we've wandered away and are lost. It is his voice that strengthens us while we are weak and when the darkness is the deepest, that we would know that he is there that we are not alone. For he has always been there with us from the beginning, because it was his own living voice which created us and then came to us in the cry of a baby. It is his voice that was not silenced on Good Friday, but cried out that all was finished, that our salvation and redemption were accomplished. And it is his voice that is still sounding this Easter, calling the hurt and the lost, calling the confused and the broken back to him, calling all of us to repentance, life, and faith, calling out to us, but also coming after us. Because Jesus doesn't simply call out to us from afar, hoping we might be persuaded to come to him. No, Jesus seeks us out as he calls for us. For he sought us out from our very beginnings and then named us as his own when we were baptized. And he still seeks us out after our baptisms. For our shepherd bids each one of us to come to his altar each weekend to find our rest and healing in him. He invites us to come forward, kneel, and receive him in his body and blood given and shed for us. To hear his word that says, this is my body, which it most surely is, and that says, this is my blood, shed for the forgiveness of your sins, which it most surely does. To hear those words, and to take eat, and to take drink, and to be forgiven and healed. To be put back together, to be cared for, to be shepherded. And so if it takes trials and troubles and struggles and crosses in your life to give you the actual life Jesus wants for you, then that is what your shepherd will do. It is actually a gracious thing, as St. Peter said in our epistle reading. It is a working of God's grace for us and in us. For truth be told, we like our silly little lives and our silly little pleasures and our little pet sins far too much. But that is not good enough for Jesus. He has come to give us more than all that because we are his. And maybe he has to take away the less in our lives to give us the greater. Maybe he has to pry your cold, dead hands off your old life and sins to give you his new life. If so, thanks be to God. He is not punishing you, but saving you. He's calling you, teaching you, he's shepherding you. For that is the kind of shepherd you have in Christ Jesus. A shepherd who is always bringing you back to the sheepfold. One who is always calling out to you. One who will discipline you, but one who takes care of you and heals you. One who is giving you a true life and not a picturesque and idyllic life. No, you have a shepherd who is always giving you an abundant life. A life full of mercy and forgiveness. An abundant life. A life spilling over into the next and greater life yet to come. Amen. Now the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight. 
through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen.